focus on the topic of crisis in the intermarium, war in Ukraine, and its implications. Today's joint virtual symposium is organized by the Institute of World Politics and is in honor of Lady Blanca Rosenstiel. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two online MAs, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. On behalf of IWP, I'd like to thank all our supporters who make these events possible. Today we'll hear from Mitzi Perdue in a lecture entitled Corruption in Ukraine. War correspondent Mitzi Perdue specializes in Russian war crimes, including abducted children, landmines, and cyber warfare. Since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, she's had more than 100 columns published in outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and Epoch Times. She is a past president of the 40,000-member American Agri-Women Organization, a U.S. delegate to the United Nations Conference on Women in Nairobi, and a former commissioner of the National Commission on Libraries and Information Science. She proudly considers IWP as one of her best sources for background for stories. Please welcome Ms. Purdue. Hello, members of IWP. I'm so excited to be with you today and to share information that I picked up as a result of three trips to Ukraine, usually as guests of the Kiev Region Police, and also Almost every week, I talk two or three times with people in Ukraine. So that's where I'm, where I'm coming from and sharing this with you. But I want to talk particularly about the issue of corruption. Because the future of Ukraine truly depends on if they can get a handle on this. And there's so many problems in dealing with it. But to give you sort of a background of it to start with, Let's look at the issue of, of what it's like to live in a country that is absolutely overwhelmed by corruption. And as a social worker told me a while ago, the worst legacy of, of the Soviet occupancy of Ukraine was they taught people corruption. Now, I want you to imagine something for a moment. In fact, I'm going to ask you to imagine several things. Let's consider, for example, you want your kid to get into a good school. You have to bribe somebody. Let's say you've got a legal case going and you want to win. You have to bribe somebody. Let's suppose you want to get a good job. Or let's suppose you want your kid to have something cushy in the military. If you know, he's going to get drafted, but that he gets treated really well. What do you do? You bribe people. Or you want the contract, whatever it is. And here's what's wrong with that. What's totally wrong with corruption is, well, there's many things, but among the things are corruption is just massively inefficient. If you want your country to flourish and really join the community of nations, like particularly Europe, you're at a competitive, you're at an extraordinary competitive disadvantage. And what do I mean by that? Well, every dollar that gets that gets diverted, it gets diverted from, let's say somebody's accepting a bribe, or maybe there's nepotism going on, or maybe somebody's just skimming money off of, of purchases, let's say from the military. What that means is, what that translates into is, your country is going to be poor because every dollar that goes into corruption, like bribery or skinning money, every dollar or yeah, if every unit of, of currency, instead of going to like education or defense or infrastructure, it's probably going to the equivalent of somebody's mistress's twenty million dollar apartment in Dubai. It's not going to help Ukraine. Another reason that Ukraine is eh, just so, so victimized by the Soviet system 
is how how do you get people to invest in your country when when you know even to get your foot in the door you've had to pay like a two hundred percent bribe. I mean, I've heard Ukrainians say you can deal with a five percent bribe, but but the bribes are just you know, they're ruinous. So you can't get people to invest in your country, and then it's really hard to get donors to give. Now, how do you solve the problem of corruption? It's, it's just unthinkably di difficult. Quick, quick, quick story. This was told to me by General Andriy Nebitov. Nebitov is head of the Kiev Region Police. I think he's had that job, this is a guess, maybe 10 years or so. When he first got in, when he first got the job, he discovered that so many police were on the take that he fired 11% of them. Now, imagine that you're General Nebutov and you've fired, he has 6,400 people under him. You've fired 11% of those and good Lord, you've made enemies for life. But it's worse than just making a typical enemy for life. No, these guys, <laughs> they know everything, the inside of how the police works. They, they know the names of people, they know their families, they know their M.O. It, it's just, I mean, can you even imagine the courage that it must have taken to fire 11% of the people of the police force? That's the kind of, like, backbone and courage, backbone and courage it takes. Whew. To, to go up against corruption. Well, let's take it a little bit farther. You want to do something about corruption, and you study how other countries do it, and here's among the things that you're up against. Maybe you arrest somebody, but the judiciary is corrupt. They, they, they get off. Uh, or one of the best ways of attacking corruption, and this has worked in, in like the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, they've, they've made massive improvements in their, in their ability to, no, not in their ability, in the fact of diminishing, diminishing corruption. Here's what they do, and, and what works. I mean, it's gradual. I spoke with somebody from Estonia who said that they've been working on this for 30 years, but he said, we're now down in the realm of corruption that we're probably not going to get do much better than this, and that is where it takes a 5% bribe instead of a 200% bribe, people skinning stuff off. He said, the absolute best way of dealing with it in their experience is massive publicity. You find somebody who's, let's say, accepted a bribe. In fact, I'll give an actual case. This is something that happened in Ukraine, but let's for the moment pretend it happened in Estonia. A guy comes in, and he's the person who can get the zoning permit for your, your six-story office building. And he said, yeah, I can get it for you right off. Mm, however, you know, kind of quietly, I would really like you to donate all the revenue from the fifth floor of your office building. Do that, and oh, I can make things smooth and easy for you, and, and you'll get your zoning. Just, just give me the fifth floor. Well, that you know, that's a somewhat typical case of corruption. Now, we're supposing this did happen in Ukraine, but as I said, we're pretending for the moment it's Estonia. And I'll tell you why in a moment, why we're picking on Estonia and not Ukraine for this. Let's say it happened in, in Estonia. What you do is, you, you being the building owner, you arrange with uh, some people in law enforcement to document that this attempt at a bribe was made. And here's what you do. You absolutely document it. The guy goes to prison, and here's the really big important part. There's massive publicity. There's total shame. The guy's doing jail time, and the world knows, and his family knows, that, that he's, he's done something to undermine the country. You know, there, there's basically some real 
And there's some real shame associated with it. Now, here's why I pretended that this happened in Estonia instead of Ukraine. Now, let's say the same thing happens in Ukraine. The building inspector says, mm, I'd like my 5%, I'd like to have the fifth floor of the building. You go through the same procedure, you contact the police, you being the owner of the building. And here's a number of things that can go wrong. The biggest of which is, supposing you've got the guy nailed, supposing he's going to do jail time, yay. Uh, supposing you're shaming him and his family is, you know, just it's a terrible thing. I mean, sunlight, sunlight really is the best, the, the best disinfectant. But in this case, the Russians, they, one of their biggest efforts in propaganda is to paint Ukraine as being irredeemably corrupt. So you publicize this, the Russians from their troll farms are going to exaggerate and magnify it. Uh, in fact, something that I learned from Professor Glancy at IWP is that every good propaganda effort has three efforts. And what we're talking about right now is Russian propaganda to totally discredit Ukraine. Well, not totally, but to make a massive black mark against Ukraine. And here's, here's the elements that help them do it. And again, the goal is, the Russian propaganda goal is to make Russia look so irredeemably corrupt that in the end, they don't, they, they discourage military aid, they discourage um, investment, they discourage charitable donations because, you know, the recipient is going to hear about all this massive corruption. Well, now back to Professor Glancy's, I hope I got your title right, Professor, but, um, or Dr. Glancy at least. Dr. Glancy told me three elements of, of a successful propaganda effort. And you know, the corruption issue, the guy with the fifth floor that was supposed to go to the zoning commissioner, here's, here's how that just plays into the three elements. Number one, element number one, it's awfully hard to gin up successful propaganda out of nothing. You want to work with something, and in this case, uh, yeah, there really was corruption. This guy that's in the newspapers and that everybody's talking about right now. I'm filming this, by the way, in, in New York, and my apartment is somewhat near LaGuardia. But we're all friends, we can deal with that, right? Okay, now back to uh, the three elements of corruption and how exposing and giving sunlight to the uh, to the corruption of, of the fifth floor, the fifth floor, floor bribe thing. Okay, it makes the papers good enough. But the Russian troll farms just seize on this because it's something real. It's something that you've read in the papers. It's credible. We now go on to step number two. Step number two in effective propaganda is it's something you kind of want to believe. And it's not too hard for the rest of the world to sort of want to believe, because they already believe it, that Ukraine is terribly corrupt. So it's, it's not that hard to sell. And then the third element of corruption, uh, sorry, of, prop, of successful propaganda is there's like a poison pill inserted in, in the partly true part. And the poison pill in this case, and what the Russians are taking advantage of, is they can say that the corruption is infinitely worse than, than it actually is. I mean, I'm, I'm making this up as I go along, but I think I'm going to be directionally accurate. Instead of saying that it's the fifth floor of one office building, they'll say, did you know that this happens in every transaction? And um, they can get other trolls to come in and say, oh yeah, my cousin works in the zoning commission, and I know that this is true. And then somebody else says, yeah, and I'm connected with the bank, and I see it happen all the time. So you, as a consumer of social media, you're hearing from just every direction that this 
like one little piece of the of the story, which is the true part. There was corruption in the zoning in this one building. Pretty soon it gets magnified until it includes oh, every part of Ukraine. And you're hearing it from you know hundreds of different sources. The initial part was true. You kind of want to believe it. And you're hearing it from sources all over. And it happens to be fake. But it's, you know, in, in you, the recipient of this, of all this, you, you feel pretty strongly that it must be true because you hear it from so many people. And often, I, a little digression here, how troll farms work. Uh, I'm going to guess that most of you know what a troll farm is. But I come across, possibly not people at IWP, have no idea the extensiveness of troll farms. I've had people tell me that we can't, we in the West can't know how many there are, but that a defensible number of troll farms, that is people, and we're talking about Russia right now, sitting maybe in St. Petersburg, figuring out how to use social media in order to skew our view of, of, of what's going on in Ukraine. Okay, how many? I've heard that between 5,000 and 10,000 are defensible numbers. And how big is a troll farm? Well, it might be one or two or three people. The biggest that I know of is a thousand people. It's in St. Petersburg and it operates around the clock in most of the languages of the world. And they have psychologists, psychiatrists, and these aren't street thugs who are working on it. No, the large numbers of them have PhDs and they spend their whole time trying to figure out how to influence our opinion. Well, let me give you some facts about how seriously the Ukrainians take, take the issue of the perception of them. Number one, there's a woman, her name is Olga, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, but it's like Trilla. Uh, she's from Ukraine. And she is working you know, night and day on the issue of corruption. And her view is that Russia is doing, with its troll farms, is doing everything it can to convince the world that Ukraine is just hopelessly corrupt, the most corrupt nation in the world. She points out a couple of facts that, that I want to share with you. I wrote about this and I interviewed her and I checked with her to make sure I had them right. Fact, in Ukraine today, for the last few years, actually pretty solidly since 2014, corruption is, how about the major issue in Ukraine after war? I mean, people in Ukraine realize what, what a big issue corruption is, and they want to do something about it. They they have had some pretty extraordinary success because, like, I, I want to give you some examples of, of what's been done. They're in the middle of a war right now, but even so, anti-corruption groups have been tracking, say, the cost of what mm, eggs cost in, in Ukraine and what the military are paying for them. And because there was such a big discrepancy, they suspected corruption, they investigated and even in the middle of a war, they fired people who were engaged in this corruption. And here's kind of a measure of their success. There is a global organization that tracks corruption. It, it tracks it for 180 different countries. And in, in this tracking of corruption, a few years ago, Ukraine ranked 122nd out of 180 countries. With the efforts that they're making today, even with the war going on, they're now 116. I'm not good at math in my head, but I think that's they've leapfrogged six other countries in their efforts to, to correct or mitigate corruption. Now, since the troll farms of Russia are trying to convince everybody in the world that Ukraine's the most corrupt, and remember they're 116 right now, 180. Where does Russia rank? 135th. So Russia, which is trying to paint 
Ukraine is just hopelessly corrupt is itself vastly more corrupt than Ukraine. And Ukraine is making progress. And from all that I hear, Russia is either making no progress or it's getting worse. So uh, Ukrainians recognize the importance of corruption. And even with the war going on, even knowing that the Russian trolls are going to magnify any effort they have to publicize this, uh, they still are working on it. It's, in my opinion, awesome. Well, let me bridge now to some of the things that can be done about corruption. And I'm going to take the example of landmines. And you might wonder how landmines and corruption connect, but here's the answer. When the war is over, the expectation is that there will be tens of billions of dollars spent on cleaning up the landmines. Right now, 40% of the country is contaminated with landmines, and they've got to do something about it because, well, among other things, Russia targeted prime agricultural land. And, you know, if, you're, if you have prime agricultural land and you can't farm it because, you know, you take your heavy equipment over the fields and it blows up the equipment and possibly kills you, that's, that's you know, you just got to fix it. So, one of the top priorities for reconstruction is landmine clearance. And as I said, billions and billions of dollars. And where does corruption come in? Well, I've been told that you can be guaranteed that right now in Ukraine, there are bunches of people figuring out, hmm, how can I get some of those lucrative contracts? And here's how it's done under a corrupt regime. And in a moment, by the way, I'm going to jump into how you can mitigate this and without even publicity. Well, with some publicity. Here's how it works. I'm going to tell how the corruption part might work. And then I'll tell how a mitigation might work. Okay, you're one of these bad guys. Let's let's call you mm, Vadim. I'm making this name up. You're Vadim. You grew up under corruption and you don't even really think it's a bad idea. You just think, eh, I want to get what's mine. So, you have no experience in landmine clearance. How do you get the contract? You happen to have some corrupt money from other sources, so you've got money available for bribery. You find the person who's going to be making the, the decision in Ukraine, and you pay an almighty bribe, but actually it's like, so supposing, again, I'm making this up, but the principle's going to be correct. Supposing it's a contract for $10 million, not unreasonable, by the way, you give, you give Ivan, I don't know, 100000 The profit that you make is extraordinary, but what about the fact that, you, uh, that you've got no background in this? Not to worry because Ivan goes to other people and they all collude and all the people who are competing with you, with you for the contract for the such and such region, you find ways to eliminate them. Uh, you know, you can be very creative about this, but basically only your, only your offer rises to the top and gets accepted. <coughs> and actually, since you've got to perform something uh, you will do some landmine clearance. You'll, you'll subcontract with people. But an estimate that I heard from somebody who's involved in landmine clearance and the expectation of what would happen if, if there aren't some guardrails put in, the, the donor agency might only have 20% of the money that they've donated for landmine clearance go to actual landmine clearance. Instead, the various corrupt officials along the way uh, have spent it, I don't know, for their mistress's apartment or jewels or for coats or Ferraris or whatever. Uh, that is a realistic danger. So what do you do about it? Fortunately, since, since combating corruption is, is the second biggest goal of, of the Ukrainian people, according to their equivalent of Gallup, there's a lot of support for doing something about it. And here's Here's a hypothetical way of dealing with it, and I can promise you that there are a lot of people working on exactly this problem. And here's how it would go. 
I've told you how the corruption might happen. Here's how it might be mitigated. And, and honest, there are people working on exactly this right now. You say there's a particularly large minefield. Maybe it's, well, it's, it's an area that the Russians particularly mind to cause maximum disruption in civil society. You know, playgrounds, um, just thousands of acres near a big city. And it's got to be cleared. Let, let's say it's 10,000 acres. Here's, here's the steps that, you, that might be taken, and, and I actually think will be taken. A large group of mining, anti-mining experts from throughout the world will be called on to examine the history of these particular, this particular area. And I, let's say it's 10,000 acres. They learn the likelihood of the density of the landmines, the kinds that were used, the terrain, the equipment that might be best suited for, for attacking the problem. And you know, it's, it's quite site specific, but you know, they're, in this world, there are, there are academic institutions and private enterprise and the Halo Trust. There are large numbers of people who have deep knowledge of what it should cost to clear landmines. Okay, they get together, they they make their best estimate of sort of the high and the low of what it might cost to, to clear that field. Then the Ukrainian government would send out a request for proposal and invite people very publicly, and not just from Ukraine, to compete with each other for this. And then uh, there, when, when the bids are in, how about they're on the blockchain so they can't be revised and jiggled with? Uh, and the panel of experts will choose who seems to be best qualified. Then, when it comes to delivery, the now everything is public. Everything, including like how much, what, what the requirements were, what they're supposed to be doing, what the payout is, and it, it's now publicly on the blockchain. So, supposing you're a committee who of civilians who live in the area where it's supposed to be cleared, uh, you're out there taking photographs of seeing how well they're doing, and you know that's public. So between blockchain and how about accounting principles of what it should cost and how the money is dispersed, uh, with, with increased visibility, there's a really good chance that, that it's going to be, you know, instead of bidding 200%, for, for what it should cost. No, you might have your 5% because the bidding is scrutinized by world experts and you're competing against others and it's public. I think that has a good chance of making a real difference in corruption. And as, as I promised, I know of people who are working on this plan right now. So I think the future for, for Ukraine and its anti-corruption efforts are really very, very promising. I think, you know, I told you that I've been to Ukraine three times. The amount of cards and backbone that, that people in this country have, I ended up loving them. I, I'm ready right now to spend the rest of my life doing whatever I can to help Ukraine, including, I've written 110 published articles on Ukraine, uh, I've raised, I think I've raised close to $2 million right now for Ukraine. And anybody who wants or can figure out how to help me in my quest to be more effective for helping Ukraine, please contact me. My email, which by the way, I don't share with other people, but with this audience, with you from IWP, eh, it's yours. Contact me at Mitzi at missypurdue.com, or even better, or I'm not sure it's better, but do it, uh, come to my website, missypurdue.com, and I would love for you maybe to look at some of the articles that I've written, uh, but just overall, I would love to be in contact with you. We're, we're allies in the same cause, and let me hear from you. Thanks for your time.